Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining us. I am Brahima Kulubali, Vice President of the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. It's a great honor and privilege uh, for me to open this event to launch a new Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings. We are very grateful for the participation of the UN Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, and the Rockefeller Foundation President, uh, Raj Shah, both exemplary global leaders on sustainable development who took time out of their busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, Amina and Raj, uh, we are very honored by your presence and your participation. The launch of the center is a historic moment for the global program and Brookings. At a time of massive dislocation in the global economy, the needs for improved policies to build back better, more inclusive and sustainable economies have never been greater. Policymakers and all other stakeholders around the world will have in this center, its scholars and Brookings, thought leadership on various aspects of sustainable development. Uh, we are grateful to all of our partners whose supports have been instrumental to the inception of the center. A special thank you to Richard Blum, whose support through the Brookings Blum High Level Policy Roundtables on Sustainable Development over the past several years have inspired the creation of the center. The launch of the center would not have been possible without the efforts of many who have worked tirelessly uh, behind the scenes. So let me take a brief moment to recognize my colleague, Ohomi Karas, and all scholars in the center, including the inaugural director, John MacArthur, all the staff in Global, uh, notably David Bacek and the communications team, as well as our colleagues across the institution, particularly central communication. And importantly, the strong commitment of our president, uh, General John Allen, who, as you know, is very passionate uh, about global development. Uh, thank you, John, for your unwavering support and for your exemplary leadership at this defining moment for global development. So with these few words, uh, let me end here and turn it over to you, John. Well, Dr. Kulabali, uh, cool. Uh, thank you for your typically warm uh, and comprehensive remarks. And let me echo all of the thanks that you have uh, issued and rendered to those who have had such an important role in all that we're doing today. And I wanna thank you for your leadership, your tremendous leadership of the Global Economy and Development Program here at Brookings. But let me hasten to add how grateful we are today for the president, for the presence of the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Her Excellency Amina Mohammed. It is always a great honor for me to share any event with you, ma'am, and you grace us with your presence today at Brookings. And let me also add, uh, it's wonderful to see my friend Raj Shah, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. We've known each other a long time, and he has been a model for me uh, to understand the imperative of global development. And we wouldn't be where we are today, Raj, without you and your great organization. So please accept my deepest and sincere thanks on this day. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you may be. And welcome to today's virtual launch of the Brookings Center for Sustainable Development. We are absolutely de delighted to have you join us for this important event. It is moments like these where even as we celebrate the start of an exciting initiative, such as the Brookings Center for Sustainable Development, that it becomes immediately apparent what unusual and indeed precarious times we're living in. With the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic earlier this year, which has robbed us of over a million precious lives worldwide and caused the greatest economic crisis since the Great Recession and perhaps even the Great Depression, the need to address issues of inequality, structural racism and inequity, the threat of climate change and the troubling decline of international cooperation has become even more paramount. Such issues all enshrined in the United Nations 17 2030 Sustainable Development Goals were long considered a North Star for the leaders across the world, something to which we could all steer our efforts. It can be argued that this may be one of the greatest accomplishments of the United Nations in the modern era, securing the future of our children. Now created to build a global commitment to a common good, the SDGs as they're called, echoed much of the original tenets that inspired the creation 
of the United Nations 75 years ago. Unfortunately, despite having originally been a keen leader in implementing the SDGs, the United States has since demonstrated and evidenced a decline in its commitment to these values. Actions such as withdrawing from crucial agreements like the Paris Climate Accord or disengaging with the World Health Organization have only done the UN and the world a disservice, directly affecting both the US and the world's progress towards achieving these vital goals. You know, I often make the point that there's a key difference today between US leadership, particularly in this administration, and traditional American leadership, meaning American national commitment to an international rules-based, values-based leadership that has largely defined the world order in the last 70 plus years in close partnership, frankly, with the United Nations. At the best of times, these two forms of leadership have largely been in synchronization, sync. And America and our partners have been able to lead by example and be transformational all over the world. But sadly, that's not the case today. While the current leadership of the US might not be supportive of international action on SDGs, American leadership is alive and well within many different sectors, such as academia, business, philanthropy, civil society, and local government, where many have stepped forward and mobilized their respective organizations and institutions to make a real impact. In time, I hope we will reunite these two forms of leadership within the US, but for now, it will be through these diverse parts of our society that we see a thriving new type of leadership taking place, a coalition of the willing, willing who are at this event today aptly titled, charting a new course towards economic, social, environmental progress and building a future that leaves no one behind. Indeed, it is with a commitment to these same creeds that we at Brookings have decided to take part following our own mission of always working in support of the public good to create the Center for Sustainable Development. For us, this is American leadership in action as it should be. We all have an obligation to lead on these issues. It's not just our hope, it is our mission. Now designed to be Brookings institutional commitment to the global sustainable development agenda, the UN sustainable development goals, the center also institutionalizes a core group of leading Brookings scholars whose work focuses on these issues. Under the direction of Brookings senior fellow, John MacArthur, the, center, the center's group of experts will be able to maximize these focus, focuses uh, on issues such as extreme poverty, the leave no one behind agenda, agenda, foreign aid effectiveness, the metrics of sustainable development, sustainable development finance, climate change, and much more. I could not be more proud or more thrilled indeed uh, that we are able to accomplish this important milestone and commitment and that Brookings is making this commitment today to our global community. Uh, more, I, I cannot be more honored than that the likes of John MacArthur and many of our amazing scholars have joined such an excellent and noble cause. This task will not be easy. If the world is to meet the targets set by the SDGs by 2030, we must foster an inclusive recovery post COVID-19 and a commitment to build back better. However, I have little doubt that even within such a challenging environment, John and his colleagues will rise above our greatest expectations. It's a great day for Brookings and we're very proud to invite those who have joined us today uh, to serve with us alongside the, the United Nations in achieving these very, very important goals. So with that, let me turn the floor over to United Nations Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, who will present her own keynote remarks. And Madam Secretary General, let me close where I began. We are so honored by your presence this morning and so deeply grateful that you would join us at this important day for the Brookings Institution. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, General Allen. It's a real pleasure um, to be with you today. And I would like to thank all my friends for inviting me to this important occasion. It is exciting to join the Brookings Institute to launch this bold new center that will tackle head on the world's biggest sustainable development challenges. I'd like to salute Brookings and its team for sending its own crisp signal to the world that the issues of sustainable development are center stage for all of humanity. 
As Secretary General Guterres recently said in his Mandela lecture, I quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the fragility of our world and it has laid bare risks we have long ignored. Inadequate health systems, gaps in social protection, structural inequalities, environmental degradation, the climate crisis, unquote. The Sustainable Development Goals, I believe, are the best roadmap, the best North Star, as General Allen has said, for the world in addressing that fragility and for transitioning to a new place of economic, social and environmental resilience. General Allen, let me also please take a moment just to thank you for your personal commitment and passion for the SDGs. Your inspiring comments today and also those of a few weeks ago when we were together at the 17 Rooms event that Brookings helped to convene underscore the power of the goals in bringing people together around a common frame of ambition and cooperation. I know that many people have made it possible today, as Kulibali has just said to us, but it's also a special pleasure to join you to celebrate the center's extraordinary starting team of scholars. And just permit me a minute to go through them because many are my long-term friends. Amar Batashasharaya, a global leader on climate and sustainable infrastructure, who has over the years provided such invaluable support to the UN's work, and let me just say, even in this last couple of weeks. Marcella Escobari has been an entrepreneurial leader, not just for development issues across Latin America and the Caribbean, but also for future workforce issues within the US itself. Homi Karas, my brother of another mother, has been a driving force at the heart of the global SDG agenda since before its inception and continues to lend crucial assistance to our UN team in navigating this year's global financing crisis. George Ingram has had a uniquely distinguished career in fostering so many cross-partisan, cross-sectoral US leadership contributions to global development over the years. Tony Pippa, another ally of ours, who was of course the lead negotiator for the SDGs over the final year leading up to their 2015 adoption and today plays a pioneering role in fostering city-based multilateral cooperation for the goals, but Tony was also there for climate. And of course to John, John MacArthur, the new center director has been my ally and collaborator for nearly two decades in promoting practical and people-focused leadership, first with the Millennium Development Goals, and then more recently with the Sustainable Development Goals. So as we turn to what the center can do for the world, at the UN, we are all too familiar with the world's shifting political contours and how escalating tensions are amplifying today's crises to hurt people and the planet. We need creative and courageous leadership from all corners, yes, even and especially from think tanks. We need your insights, your independence, your ideas, your recommendations and your voices. We also simply need role models of collaboration and international cooperation. One of the things that makes this effort unique is the focus that the center will have on network leadership and a no one left behind philosophy. None of us can achieve the SDGs alone. All of us need to pitch together. Everyone needs to be at the table in our communities around the globe. If we are to end extreme poverty, end the pandemic of inequality and protect the climate and oceans for future generations. In this respect, I'd like to challenge the Center for Sustainable Development to strive to be a beacon of inspiration for the pursuit of sustainable development in all our countries and the communities around the world where these will make most impact. Together with partners and allies, I encourage you to leverage your independent voice to better understand the issues, to seek the insights of the young, or marginalized and to think more clearly about the options and the solutions to expend our sense of possibility. The Brookings team has already contributed so much in helping the world to tackle its great challenges of sustainable development and so much more. But I know we're only just getting started. We have a decade to go for achieving the, M the SDGs and I really can't wait to see what we do next together. Um, and at this juncture, it is my 
deep, deep, deep pleasure. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about this. Handing over to my friend, Sean MacArthur. Thank you so much, Madam Deputy Secretary General uh, Amina. It's such a privilege and honor and special moment for all of us to be here with you. <laughs> and thank you for your ever inspiring leadership on behalf of the whole world uh, for what you do every day to bring us together. I also just wanna start uh, by thanking uh, John Allen, <laughs> General Allen, uh, Brahima Koulibaly and everyone at Brookings, our partners around the world and so many people who have been instrumental in recent weeks, months, and years in bringing us to this day of launch. But before anything else, we also uh, are privileged to have a message that we received from the World Health Organization Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros. And we just wanted to share that briefly before we dive into the rest of the discussion. So if we could please uh, pull up that video. It is my pleasure to send my best wishes for the launch of the new Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution. The world was struggling to meet the sustainable development goals before the COVID-19 pandemic. We're even further behind now. The Center for Sustainable Development can help to get us back on track by accelerating progress through innovation and partnerships. I welcome the Center's mission of bipartisan leadership in sustainable development. My congratulations to everyone involved at the Center for Sustainable Development and especially to your inaugural director, my friend, John MacArthur. We look forward to a close and fruitful partnership. I thank you and wish you all the very best. We thank you, Dr. Tedros, for all that you're doing and for your kind words uh, today and, and on behalf of the world to get us through this pandemic to the other side. So some of you might be asking, what will this center do? Well, we've already heard uh, some of the central themes ranging from leave no one behind to network leadership around the world. But we decided to take on five starting topics. First, defining the challenge, what we call sustainable development economics and empirics. Second, identifying instruments to advance SDG implementation in all countries around the world. Third, advancing sustainable development at local levels, bringing these issues to the communities where they matter most. Fourth, advancing effective financing for sustainable development. And fifth, advancing, in the words of General Allen, both US official and American societal leadership for global sustainable development. Now, the next question after that, you might be wondering is, well, who is exactly in this center? And I'd like to take a moment to talk about each of our starting scholars, because it is quite an extraordinary team. We're so grateful to uh, Deputy Secretary General for mentioning them. But if we could just bring up a few quick uh, images to show each of the starting roster. As it was mentioned, Amar Bhattacharya is our leader on so many of the world's biggest issues at the highest levels. He's our leader on climate action and sustainable infrastructure and he's instrumental on strategies for inclusive global growth, reforming multilateralism and improving global governance. And I have to say in the lead up to the Glasgow Summit on Climate, which has been postponed from this year to next year to chart the world's future, he's our guiding light. Second is Marcela Escobari. Marcela leads the Workforce of the Future initiative and she's looking at questions like how to confront the growing divergence between places and people how to support job mobility for those who need it most. Just today, Marcel is launching a Mobilities Pathway, a new online data tool to help promote upwardly mobile jobs in very specific locations across America. Third is George Ingram, our seasoned voice on US official strategies for global development. 
George focuses on, as we've heard, promoting bipartisan US leadership, policies to support responsiveness in fragile environments, and the intersection between business development and sustainable development. Today, George is actually releasing a very important paper on how US global development structures can be updated to be fit for purpose in 2021. Fourth is Homi Karas, our most venerable scholar, without whose efforts and insights, there would simply be no center today. It's impossible to summarize the breadth of Homi's work. So let me just mention a few examples that are recent. This morning, Homi is releasing new estimates of COVID-19's effects on extreme poverty around the world. And let me just say, the news is not good. A few days ago, he co-authored a piece on China's influence on the global middle class. And as the Deputy Secretary General said this summer, he's been actively supporting the UN's policy efforts to finance a COVID-19 recovery and also avoid debt crises around the world. In a few more days, he's gonna be releasing a new paper on how to think about updating the global development architecture writ large to tackle a post-pandemic world. Fifth is Tony Pippa. Tony's our embodiment of connecting the local with the global. Again, his work is nearly impossible to summarize, but he's pursuing priorities like supporting global city to city cooperation in aligning with the SDGs and identifying policies to improve equity and racial justice while taking action on climate change. At the same time, he's working on promoting US credibility abroad by leveraging the country's domestic leaders on the SDGs to see how that can connect with the global frontier. Just next week, he's gonna be convening the SDG Leadership Cities Network to tackle innovation and exchange of partnership on how these cities can move forward together. For my own part, I pay special attention to the Leave No One Behind agenda and finding ways for diverse actors to come together, such as in the 17 Rooms Partnership, we've been privileged to launch with the Rockefeller Foundation and also focused on my home country of Canada and the United Nations to think how to get practical on the SDGs. All of this is our starting point. Before long, we hope the center can extend its focus to grow its team and take on new topics. Things like gender equality, things like private sector contributions to the SDGs writ large. But this is our starting point and we're honored to be here today to take on a next wave of effort. So with that as context, I'm honored, delighted and thrilled to be able to kick off a bit of a round table discussion with old friends, collaborators, and inspirations, uh, the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, and also I'd like to now introduce Raj Shah. Raj is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, and that's just his latest of many <laughs> contributions to the world in that role. I should note first that the uh, Rockefeller Foundation provides generous and instrumental support to this new Center for Sustainable Development, which helps make the work we do possible. So in that context, I do wanna emphasize Brookings commitment to independence and underscore that the views expressed today are solely those of the speakers. But I also wanna emphasize the role that Raj has played and Rockefeller has played on some of the most seminal issues of public well-being across the United States and around the world. Uh, Raj brings his own remarkable experience to the organization having previously served as USAID administrator under President Obama in that capacity, played a crucial role on everything from the Global Food Security Act to the Electrify Africa Act, and very importantly, the US response to the West African Ebola pandemic. And I would add, he also played a crucial role in cementing the US commitment to end extreme poverty within a generation. Before that, Raj had senior roles at US Department of Agriculture and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he was also instrumental in creating the International Financing Facility for Immunizations which helped to reshape the global vaccine industry, a topic of more than some importance today. So Raj and Amina, we're so thrilled to have you here for this uh, informal roundtable on a special day for us at Brookings. And maybe Raj, we've just heard from uh, Deputy Secretary General and you bring so many of these uh, perspectives, international and domestic, and you've been at the forefront of the fight for justice in so many ways. And I wanna just raise this issue of equity and the equity imperative of sustainable development, both in the US and internationally. How would you recommend that we all think about that issue and a warm welcome again? 
Thank you, John. And let me just start by congratulating you and General Allen and the extraordinary team at Brookings. I'm so glad uh, that you were able to introduce each of your exceptional you know, members and experts in, in many ways. Today, as Amina described in her remarks, is really a, a celebration to honor the contributions each of them have made over time. And I'm, I'm so proud to have learned from so many and continue to. So while I guess the views expressed are yours or mine or uh, the Deputy Secretary General's uh, alone, it, it is in fact their ideas that keep permeating all of our collective thinking. And I have such high hopes uh, for this center in this moment in history. I think the moment in history calls for really embracing uh, the challenge that Amina laid out in her remarks. Uh, you know, her, her example and, and your example, Amina, has been one of just uh, resilient determination to support those who are left behind. And uh, I think her career has demonstrated how from, uh, for, for many decades, how possible it is if we all come together with that determination and with the sophistication of analytics, measurement, and a focus on results. And I think in many ways, it's, it's easy to acknowledge today that the fight to achieve the SDGs uh, has been set back by this crisis. Uh, we see the World Bank estimates of 425 million people pushed back under an expanded version of, of the poverty line as a result of the global economic consequences of COVID-19. We certainly see uh, in, in the uh, goalkeepers report that we all just uh, reviewed and discussed that potentially decades of progress on basic indicators of health, education, and welfare are uh, going to be significantly impaired by the crisis and the shifting in resources to other uh, areas of, of necessary public health concern. And I suspect when you look at big picture as what, at what it is taking to recover in uh, wealthier economies with strong central banks, the answer is a tremendous amount of monetary and fiscal action that is simply not possible under current circumstances for billions and billions of people around the world. And perhaps that's maybe the central underlying concern I have for the center to address, which is, you know, after World War II, we created the Bretton Woods institutions and embarked on uh, a mindset and approach through the Marshall Plan that was determined to achieve certain types of developmental objectives and, and frankly left out some important considerations with respect to both climate and uh, good governance, shall I say, for many decades. Uh, I think I think now the center and you all as experts with such extraordinary reach and influence have a chance to, to maybe reshape and rethink what the global development pathway looks like going forward. So many of the themes in your five points are defining of that, uh, local ownership and leadership, uh, local governance and economy and economic management being perhaps at the very top of the list. And I'm glad you highlighted that. Uh, but also rethinking global institutions and the way we have executed on development, the level of resources necessary and what types of new institutional and financial arrangements need to be put into place to really support a global green recovery from this crisis that fundamentally includes those that are left behind. And, and my, on behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, in addition to supporting that mission very broadly, we are fully committed to ending energy poverty as a core driver of addressing and, and perhaps ending much of that inequity. That is just one of many issues that your lapel pin uh, indicates we all need to work on. But, uh, but where we see certain solutions, we, we believe we have to act in a bold and significant way. And we're preparing to do that as a single institution. But the global community, I think, really has a chance to step back and say, what is the Marshall Plan for this era? It's, it's not going to come from the United States or China or any one nation. It's going to come from you know, dozens or hundreds of local leaders working together to shape a vision of how to recover from COVID-19 in a way that includes 
those who we know otherwise will be left behind. Thank you, Raj, both uh, as ever insightful and uh, provocative, right full call to action. I'm curious, uh, Madam Deputy Secretary General Amina, Amina, very much along those lines, we try to respect the office <laughs> in this environment. Uh, but I know that you, uh, having had the privilege to work with you for so many years, are straddling these issues in your own mind every day, as Raj just outlined, between your home village in Nigeria, the highest level of global politics, and I see you toggling moment to moment between each reality. I'm curious how you suggest we think about this universal challenge and creating an architecture to, if I were to use a word to summarize Raj's insights, for, that'll meet the needs of the coming future. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. And, and Raj, as always, it's, it's great to hear you and, and to be privileged to have this conversation together. Um, as we look at what we sort of crafted, and let's remember that we would never would have got the ambition or the odd 17 goals if it hadn't been a process that everybody engaged in. So I think it's it very much a global response to what everyone sees themselves in. And maybe we haven't quite landed that yet everywhere, um, but it is about a global plan um, and like with all politics, um, it's local. It's very local. Um, and it is, um, I guess, investing in it in everyone's enlightened self-interest because we are so connected. So as I think about the 40,000 feet we sit up here and what happens in my um, village, um, every day you have to stay with the reality check of context. And so if we are really to apply this, it does have to be the policies that you need that need to be responsive and that you need to have tailor-made solutions um, at the country level. And depending on what kind of country, maybe it's even within the um, sub-national level that is so different from one part to another. Key to that is really going, is understanding what that context is. And I think one of the areas that we have still got quite a bit to do is uh, laying out the baselines, the data that's required to give us a proper picture in a context of what we need to do in terms of investments, capacity, stakeholders, um, a government uh, really getting its head around the spending that it must do that is more inclusive um, than we've had before. Um, and I think the frame for the SDGs helps us to have that discussion. It's remarkable that with COVID, before COVID, we were off track. We had the decade to launch. Um, but once COVID came along, that pause for reflection, what do we do now? Because it was so um, plain sight that this is now a global issue. Everyone with one tiny little virus is affected in the same way. Um, and we all shut down to try to see how we could protect ourselves individually and collectively. And then suddenly found ourselves um, seeing how this um, was bearing the fractures that we already knew and that we talked about. So having the COVID, um, uh, I think, opportunity is for us to, to look uh, country by country, community by community as a globe. Um, how do we respond to this now? Whether we have a Marshall Plan or not, it will be a response that cannot just be local. It will be embedded in the local response because those are the needs for women, for youth, for the opportunity of energy transitions, the opportunity of connectivity in the digital world. But financing that is going to require a different kind of architecture than we have right now. And so I think the global players need for us to have um, a conversation about whether the trillions that are available in a pool that we've seen spent in one part of the world have any way that we can unlock them to be more equitable in the response to COVID, but in the response to sustainable development that gives us a more equal playing field, a more stable world. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it's, uh, it's important that we sort of bring that reality check to it. Um, we have the unfinished business of the MDGs. And, you know, often people say, well, this is, you know, we've, we've the SDGs um, have taken over. They haven't. I remember Kofi Annan saying, don't forget the MDGs, they're unfinished business. They're in the first six goals. That's the unfinished business of the, of the MDGs, but it is rooted in the remaining goals that give us a interconnected um, uh, set of, of issues that if we want partnerships, that's it. So um, I would say, you know, the, the global to local is, is also about understanding what the local has to bring to the global.
um, and having that narrative and, and that discussion um, in a way that uh, I think, you know, you have the space uh, to convene on that as, as we have the space to convene across the world. I think that intellect um, that, that's needed to have those discussions uh, to bring it to a very real place is, is where you are. Thank you, Amina. And I, I think this point of what's possible <laughs> starts yeah. to come up very quickly. And Raj, you've been an irrepressible champion of technology <laughs> and equitable access, ranging from things like healthcare to energy, as you mentioned, it's part of your day to day right now. Uh, but one of the things we've seen is that, or not but, but and one of the things we've seen is the frontier is shifting and what's becoming possible is getting better all the time. And I'm curious how you suggest we think all of us on the line today think about the role of equitable access to technology as a, an advancing frontier for the world. Well, I, I, uh, I'll answer that. I want to come back to one thing Amina said, which is I, I think Brookings uh, is maybe one of the very few places on the planet that could convene the types of leaders in the right intellectual and analytic context to actually define and design a new uh, approach to ensuring that we meet the challenge she just outlined, which is it'll take literally trillions of dollars of, of public support uh, alongside private investment to drive uh, emerging economies forward in an equitable manner coming out of COVID-19. And I don't, I think the world just hasn't figured out how to do that. And right now our politics uh, are so fractured and populist that I don't see a lot of leadership on that topic. And, and I'm gonna be following you all closely for your ideas and outputs there because we desperately need it. On the issue of technology, I think it's actually related to that. You know, there's no need to build back an industrial economy that looks like it was 1958. The reality is today, you know, through Rockefeller alone, our partnerships with say Tata Power in India, where we're trying to build 10,000 rural mini grids to reach uh, 10 million people in villages that don't have meaningful, reliable electricity today. In the last few years, we've seen the cost come down from 60, 70 cents a kilowatt hour to uh, you know, close to 22, 23 cents a kilowatt hour now. And our target in just 18 months is to get it under 15 cents a kilowatt hour. The reality, I only use that as an example because these are, these are solar panels tied to lithium ion batteries and other types of battery technologies for energy storage managed by artificial intelligence, usually executed remotely. And, uh, and fed by smart meters that allow people who otherwise weren't getting electricity to pay a variable rate. And we see extremely high repayment rates. And, and the reality is, you know, that's just one example of leapfrog technologies like the mobile phone, frankly, like the concept of, of microfinance and, and banking for women uh, who are lower income and poorer, you know, that we need to embrace and scale far more rapidly. I mean, I appreciate all the kind words about immunization, but look, it's, you know, it used to take 20 years to get a, an, an, an immune, a vaccine immunized, you know, that was effectively immunizing kids in, in wealthier countries introduced in lower income ones. And then there was this big divergence and then there's been some convergence uh, but it's but outside of that example, I, you know, there still is far too much of a lack of focus on technology and the new frontiers in our quote unquote development thinking, and and I think we just desperately need to break through that and and embrace uh, new new strategies to be inclusive and green across everything we do, and that's fundamentally going to be driven by technology. It's interesting. Zia Khan, I would be remiss not to mention, who is a co-chair, of course, in the 17 Rooms process recently pointed out to me the breakthroughs in thinking about infrastructure for technology and equitable access as how it can come together as a platform for the world. Uh, so we're so grateful uh, to all the insights you're generating, in addition to the ones uh, as and your whole team, in addition to the ones uh, you might call on us to take on too. So thank you, Raj. I'm afraid we're gonna to have to adjourn in a moment, but uh, I wanna just give you each a, a last chance to share any parting thoughts before we uh, do uh, you know, adjourn for the day. Uh, 
Is there anything, uh, Raj, that you'd like to share? And then I'll give the last word to Deputy Secretary General as we all you know, kick off in this turbulent time, but aiming for a much better 2021 and beyond. I, I, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll conclude with the following. I think as, as we sit, and as I think Brookings largely uh, remains in Washington, D.C., uh, with, with experts, you know, your ability to really understand, appreciate, stay connected to, uh, maybe with less travel and more video, the realities of, of what's actually happening uh, in the communities you will seek to serve with this center will remain so important. And I was pleased to hear, I think, uh, Dr. Kulabali mentioned uh, Dick Blum and his support of the Brooking Blum's session. You know, his work with Nepalese women and girls over many decades has saved thousands of girls, but also I think been a model for just being able to be global and work with institutional leaders like, uh, like the ones you naturally do and being grounded in the realities of, of who you're serving. And I just applaud you for what you're doing, applaud General Allen for the commitment and, and I'm thrilled to be with the Deputy Secretary General today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. Amina, last okay. words? Okay, <laughs> well, they're, they're last words, never last words for me, but, but along the way, um, thank you so much. This is really important. I wanted just to mention uh, two constituencies that will be critical to this. And it's because we will not build back the same. We have to build back differently and take the opportunity of COVID and not be conquered by it. Um, and that's youth and women. And I think that this is really important because there is an intergenerational shift that must happen. And in that, we need to have um, the ability to bring them to the table um, and also to see them as assets and not just a quota that we're filling. And so how do we do that in our research? How do we do that in the planning? How do we do that in the implementation? Um, I think it's really important. Leadership is already being demonstrated by young people and by women, and we need to profit from it. Uh, so I think your convening also needs to show a different face to that table that we have um, and the center to be the touchstone when people want the solutions, they want the policy options that so they can come and uh, you can feed them with that. So they go back to their realities to see how do we figure this out? Um, and I think that's important because you're able in your independence to be you know, cutting edge ahead of the curve because you don't have 196 members that will actually you know, negotiate what the option is. And I think, you know, there's power in that and you've got an amazing team and we are looking very much forward to working with you um, on the road ahead. Um, it's extraordinarily difficult, but it's full of opportunities. And I don't think that we've ever seen um, a time in our history when we have so many tools um, and potentials and ambitions that can be fulfilled. It's about just getting us together and doing it and so keep plugging and, and, and just getting it done. So thank you for having me, General Allen. This has uh, been a pleasure and I really look forward to working with uh, John and the team and the center uh, here in Ann. Raj, thank you. Great to see you. Well, thank you, Mina. Thank you, Raj. Uh, I think the, my big takeaway here is uh, we're moving from a discussion of reset to transition. We're here to put in the work. We're here to make it count uh, in the communities where people live. We're here to help take on the global commons and we're heard here to help connect the dots between all the above in a way that the world of 2030 looks a lot better than the one of 2020. So thank you for your inspiration and leadership. We actually have some videos now from friends around the world. We're gonna conclude the formal program now, but uh, there's a lot of great voices about to come up in the next few minutes, including many of our own uh, longstanding friends and inspirations around the world. So uh, welcome our audience to listen to that, uh, starting with Mark Suzman, the CEO and president of the Gates Foundation, and then ending, uh, just to give you a little bit of a spoiler, with a very nice word from Mary Robinson, so uh, the great leader of the elders. So thank you all so much. Thank you, General Allen. Thanks, uh, Cool. Thanks, the whole Brookings team. And uh, look forward to partnering with everyone to make this come to reality. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark Sussman, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it gives me enormous pleasure to join you today and offer my congratulations to Brookings and to John MacArthur on the inauguration of the Center for Sustainable Development. I've had the honor of working with Brookings closely since I joined the foundation nearly 14 years ago, and we've worked on issues related to Africa and development for many, many years. So it's wonderful to see this new initiative coming together and Brookings' long-term commitment to sustainable development. I've had the honor of working with John even longer, 
starting when we were both at the UN working on the Millennium Project and support of the Millennium Development Goals and then the Sustainable Development Goals. And now with this new initiative, I'm incredibly excited to see the great work this new center is going to do under his leadership. And the area I would like to challenge you all to do more on, because it is the critical development intersection of our times, is gender and SDG 5. There is still so little understood about the complex interplay on gender data and its links to development. We know it is essential, but we know that we don't have the data and the policies we need to properly address it. So good luck with that, and I look forward to working closely with you going forward. I'm Elizabeth Cousins, President and CEO of the United Nations Foundation, and I am delighted to congratulate John Allen, John MacArthur, Homi Karas, Tony Pippa, and all of our good colleagues at the Brookings Institution for the exciting launch of their new Center for Sustainable Development. The team at Brookings has already played a powerful role in helping shape the intellectual underpinnings of the Sustainable Development Goals. This new center, coming as it does at such a critical time in our world, is superbly timed and placed to help drive achievement of the goals in the countdown to 2030, and as the world strives to recover from COVID-19 by putting people, planet, and equity at the heart of recovery. So on behalf of everyone at the UN Foundation, congratulations again to all of you, and we look very forward to active collaboration with John and the whole Brookings team in these critical days ahead. Congratulations. Five years ago, 193 countries came together at the United Nations to adopt the historic Sustainable Development Goals. That was a profound act of global solidarity and a pledge to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to leave no one behind. The men and women of the new Brookings Center on Sustainable Development were critical to the adoption of those sustainable development goals, but they're even more critical now to the implementation through empirical research and policy advice uh, to the global community to keep that promise and to make sure that no one is left behind. I'd like to congratulate the Brookings Institute on opening a Center on Sustainable Development and I'm delighted that John will be its first director. I'm passionate about ending child marriage and making sure that every girl, regardless of where she's born, can fulfill her full potential. So what I really hope is that the center will work to see how can we translate all the talk about breaking down the silos into reality on the ground and make sure that all these different development sectors start working better together so that we can optimize the impact and make sure that all girls can be girls and not brides. Hello, I'm Nahid Nenshi and I'm the mayor of Calgary, Canada. And I want to congratulate everyone at Brookings on the launch of the new Center for Sustainable Development under the leadership of your first director, Dr. John MacArthur. For the first time in human history, the majority of citizens of the world live in cities. And this pace of urbanization is only going to continue. So what is our role as cities in fostering economic development, environmental stewardship, and social development? These are critical questions for us to think about in every city in the world, because increasingly city issues are human issues. And I hope those are things that we get to focus on when we think about sustainable development. Congratulations, everyone on this launch. All the best. Let's improve people's lives. I would like to send my deepest regards to our friends of the Brookings Institution. A warmest recognition on the launching of its new Center for Sustainable Development within the Global Economy and Development Research Program and congratulate the newly appointed director, John MacArthur. As Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, an institution that is devoted to sustainable development and long-standing partner of Brookings, I really commend and welcome this new initiative. I'm convinced that the new Center for Sustainable Development will enable to move forward at the analytical, empirical, and practical challenges of the global and regional sustainable development agendas. The challenges of development and of global sustainability have never been more daunting or more urgent. The pandemic has multiplied the challenges. It now requires a forceful and more thoughtful 
effort to restart growth, restart development, and restart efforts to ensure a viable global future. It will require evolving our thinking on development and growth itself in both the advanced and the developing world. And it will also require a fresh take on what is required for the future. And this new Brookings Center for Sustainable Development will, I'm sure, advance this collective thinking. So I wish you all success. Hi, I'm Jeff Sachs, university professor at Columbia University and president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And I want to send my kudos uh, and my gratitude to Brookings for uh, its leadership in establishing the new Brookings Center for Sustainable Development. We need you. We know that the next years will be critical for achieving the sustainable development goals in the Paris Climate Agreement. I go back 41 years with Brookings. I could not be more thrilled at uh, the new center, and I know how much you will accomplish. I just wanted to say a big congratulations to Brookings for launching the Brookings Center for Sustainable Development, to John MacArthur and everyone there. It's just such great news. Uh, the goal I've been most involved with over the last decade plus is the Sustainable Development Goal 2, uh, Zero Hunger. And I really hope in my lifetime that we'll be able to get there. I am so hopeful and I really, really I uh, think there's so much work to be done, and yet there's so much uh, good things that have been done, and I've seen such great progress. Um, I think it's up to all of us to really tackle these massive issues that face humanity, face our environment, face our world. Hello, uh, Richard Curtis here, UN Advocate for Sustainable Development Goals and Movie Industry Advocate for More Films with Happy Endings. Huge congratulations to everyone involved in setting up the Center for Sustainable Development because the SDGs are the only plan on the table to give people and planet a brilliant outcome by 2030. Here's my big three on it. One, talk to and about business a lot because business and investment could be and should be the powerhouse driving change. Two, really fight for specific and doable solutions like a game of basketball. This has to be done basket by basket, point by point, success by specific success. And three, never forget the importance of talking to the wider public about the goals. I really believe the more famous the goals are, the more powerful a force they will be as consumers and voters cry out for them. So may the force be with you uh, and may you wind down happily in 2030, job done, Happy ending, mic drop. Congratulations to you all on the launch of the new Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings. No surprise, as Brookings and especially Homi Karas has been instrumental in its development. The only viable long-term growth path is one that is inclusive, sustainable, and respects the planetary limits now and for generations to come. Hello, my name is Enric Sala, and I care about sustainable development because there is no other way. There is no other alternative. We cannot pretend that humanity will have a happy future on an earth where we cannot do our activities forever. So I would like to congratulate the Brookings Institution on the creation of their new Center for Sustainable Development. And I would encourage you to pay special attention to the question of environmental sustainability, protection of our planet, rewilding the world as a key necessary condition for the prosperity of humanity. Congratulations, Brookings, on your new Center for Sustainable Development. And as we face more global challenges like climate change and pandemics, it's more vital than ever that communities are resilient enough to withstand those kinds of shocks. So I hope that the center looks deeply, not just at the causes of fragility and violence and loss of development gains, but very importantly, how do we as an international community organize more effectively to tackle the roots of fragility? How do we put goal 16, more accountable, more inclusive, legitimate governance at the heart of our development agenda? Thank you for the work that you do. For me, the Sustainable Development Goals provide the perfect framework, not just to think about how to build back better from COVID-19, but to, about what a really just, inclusive recovery from the pandemic should mean. 
It's really encouraging to see the Brookings Institution dedicate its energies, its focus, its resources on the question of sustainable development. For the first time in 20 years, global poverty is increasing. Tens of millions have already fallen into poverty since March. And with an increasing frequency and intensity of disasters, the challenge is becoming only greater. We need to do more. We need to ensure that the most vulnerable have an adequate safety net and that we have the tools to respond quickly and at scale as crises emerge. Specifically, let's ask, why not cash? In other words, let's default to putting the resources directly into recipients' hands and require other more active interventions to prove their case. Of course, cash won't be the solution to all problems, nor should it be 100% of what we do, but it can be the starting place. So why not cash? Hi, it's Michelle Nunn, CEO of Care USA. I want to say a big congratulations to the team that's launching the Brookings Center for Sustainable Development. It's never been more important to ensure that we have the guidance, the research, the analysis, the frameworks to actually propel our progress at a time when it's threatened with reversal. Uh, I always find it very interesting when, when people ask me why it is I care about sustainable development. And I always think to myself, honestly, there can be nothing more important right now in the world that we live than the issue of sustainable development. And it's not possible to talk enough about it because it is clearly the one thing that will guarantee us the balance in our lives, in our economies, in our societies, even in our politics, than sustainable development. My name is Mahiam Jam. I am the founder of I Am The Code. I am so excited to know that the Center for Sustainable Development has been created. Congratulations, it's wonderful. You know, for me, sustainable development means that we can accelerate humanity. My boys and girls all across the world will have access to education, a decent job, they can have access to food, something that we all take for granted. Progress is possible. When I was growing up as a young girl, I never thought I'll make this video for you. So congratulations for all the work you are doing behind the scenes for not only advancing the MDGs, but now making sure the Sustainable Development Goals is for everyone. The challenge of the transformation needed um, means that we must achieve sustainable development in a context which can appear daunting. But remember the advice of Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it is done. And all the best to Brookings with this new center. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.